At 7.42 a.m. on August 17, 1943, a 23-year-old pilot climbed into his P-38 Lightning, not knowing that he would face a swarm of 18 Japanese Zeros. Most pilots never came back, but today, everything would change. And it all started with a single piece of piano wire bent into a Z-shape in the hands of one more mission. McKenna's eyes drifted again to the man climbing into the cockpit, Lieutenant Robert Hayes. Barely 23 years old, a quiet kid from Kansas with soft blue eyes that never seemed prepared for what they had already seen. Six combat missions, zero kills, but losses, too many to count. Every new mission, Hayes had looked a little older as though each day carved another line into his face. And today, something in the air felt heavier, more tense, more final. The Japanese had sent 18 Zero fighters to intercept the American patrol. Everyone knew it. Everyone felt it. Hayes's odds were not good, and McKenna knew why. The P-38 Lightning was a magnificent machine, twin engines, razor-sharp profile, long-range endurance. A perfect killer on paper. But on the battlefield, perfection cracks under pressure. The one fatal flaw the P-38 carried, its inability to turn with a zero, was a secret whispered in every briefing room and growled through clenched teeth by every mechanic who had watched pilots die because of it. The Zero could complete a full turn in almost half the time the P-38 needed. It wasn't just a disadvantage, it was a death sentence. McKenna had seen the consequences up close. Six weeks earlier, Lieutenant Chen, a shy, brilliant pilot who always polished his boots even in the muddiest monsoon season, had gone out on a routine escort mission. Before taking off, he detold McKenna, plane feels slow to roll, something's off. McKenna checked the controls but found nothing outside the manual's tolerances. The aircraft manual said the aileron cables could have up to three-eighths of an inch of slack. Acceptable, the book said, normal variation. So McKenna had sent him into the sky because the manual said so. Chen never returned. His wingman later reported that during a turn fight with a zero, Chen's lightning didn't roll fast enough, giving the enemy a perfect entry into his inside arc. A burst of gunfire, a trail of smoke. Then the jungle took him forever. After Chen's death came Captain Morrison, a confident ace with 11 kills and a reputation for laughing in the face of danger. Even he radioed during a mission that his controls felt mushy. Minutes later, his plane spiraled into the ocean. Another pilot error, the report said. The problem, they claimed, wasn't the aircraft, it was the men flying it. But McKenna wasn't a man who accepted easy answers. He wasn't educated beyond high school, and he didn't have engineering degrees like the officers back in the States, but he had something they didn't, a mechanic's sixth sense, a feeling in his bones that something was wrong. He had crawled through enough wreckage, examined enough shattered control surfaces, and listened to enough dying engines to know when a machine was lying. And the P-38 was lying. That tiny amount of slack, less than half an inch, wasn't just a harmless tolerance. In the smooth safety of test flights, maybe it meant nothing. But in combat, when a pilot yanks the stick and expects instant obedience, even a tenth of a second delay can determine whether he lives or dies. McKenna could feel the slack when he pulled the cable by hand. It was subtle, almost invisible, but deadly. He reported it through the proper channels. The engineering officer listened, squinted at the cable, and said the words that made McKenna's blood boil. Within factory spec, Lockheed was 7,000 miles away in California. They had blueprints and measurements. McKenna had wrecks, funerals, and the last words of pilots who trusted him. But rules were rules. Modifications required approval. Approval required time. And time was the one thing war never offered. So McKenna decided to break the rules. The night before Hayes's mission, he walked into the dimly lit hangar with a purpose he hadn't felt in months. The generators hummed like distant thunder. Shadows pooled under each aircraft, and the smell of grease and metal filled the air. McKenna pulled out a small piece of piano wire from a wrecked plane, six inches long. It was thin, flexible, but strong enough to handle consistent tension. He bent it into a Z-shape using a pair of worn pliers. His hands shook slightly, not from fear, but from exhaustion. His knuckles were raw and scarred, and the tiny wire bit into his skin as he worked. 
A bead of blood formed, ran down his thumb, and fell onto the metal surface with a soft tap. He ignored it. He unbolted the access panel. A pin dropped into the darkness, forcing him to spend five minutes crawling on the concrete floor, cursing quietly until he found it. The whole time he imagined the consequences. Court-martial, prison, dishonorable dismissal. But he imagined something worse. Hayes dying the same way Chen and Morrison had. That thought made the decision simple. He slipped the tensioner into place and tightened it until the cable pulled taut. No slack, not a millimeter. For the first time, the P-38's aileron system felt like it should have felt all along. When he moved the surfaces by hand, they responded instantly, as though eager to fly. Eight minutes of work. Eight minutes that might decide who lived tomorrow. At dawn, Hayes climbed into the cockpit. He didn't know about the modification. Regulations would never allow it. But he trusted McKenna. Pilots always trusted the men who kept their wings intact. Hayes gave a tired smile, adjusted his oxygen mask, and closed the canopy. McKenna slapped the fuselage twice, a silent gesture used by countless mechanics to say, Come back alive. What? The lightning's engines roared to life, twin Allison V-12s shaking the very ground as the propellers carved the morning air. Hayes taxied, lined up, and took off into the golden dawn. McKenna watched until the aircraft was a shrinking silver spark against the endless sky. Seventeen minutes later, the Japanese came. Reports later described the scene. Nine zeros sweeping down from altitude, sun behind them gliding silently until their engines erupted into a shrieking dive. Hayes and his flight were caught mid-climb. It should have been a slaughter, but something unexpected happened. Hayes' dove fired mist. A zero snapped into a roll to evade him, and Hayes, almost without thinking, rolled after it. Instantly he felt it, the missing delay, the mushiness gone. His plane rolled like a living creature, sharp and immediate. For the first time in his career, Hayes wasn't late into the turn. He wasn't behind the zero. He was right on its tail. The Japanese pilot realized too late that the American plane shouldn't have been able to follow him. Hayes squeezed the trigger. The P-38's cannons erupted, Tracers stitched across the Zero's fuselage. Flames burst. The aircraft spiraled into the jungle. One kill. Then three Zeros dove toward him. Doctrine said he should disengage, but Hayes felt something he had never felt before, control. Confidence. His aircraft obeyed him like it was reading his mind. He yanked left. The lightning snapped into a turn so sudden the Zero overshot. Hayes fired. The wing tore off. Second kill. The remaining two zeros tried a scissors maneuver, weaving back and forth to trap him. Hayes matched them reversal for reversal, each move crisp and instant. No delay, no sluggish roll. In a tight break, one zero lost speed. Hayes fired from 200 feet. Third kill. The last zero fled the fight. Seven minutes. Three kills. A rookie pilot had just done what veterans struggled to accomplish. When Hayes landed, the P-38's tires screeched across the dirt runway, and the engines wound down with a tired sigh. The canopy opened. Hayes climbed out, drenched in sweat, breathing hard. He didn't speak to anyone. He walked straight to McKenna, grabbed him by the shoulders, and whispered, It worked. Other pilots had seen the fight from above. They wondered how Hayes's aircraft rolled so unnaturally fast, like a different machine entirely. Captain Mitchell approached McKenna and asked, what did you do to that plane? And when he learned the truth, he said only one thing. Do mine next. That night another plane was modified, then another. Then an entire squadron, eight minutes per aircraft, eight minutes that changed the Pacific Air War. By late August, kill ratios shifted. What had been a humiliating disadvantage began to equalize. Japanese pilots grew confused when P-38s, they once easily outturned, suddenly matched their maneuvers. Saburo Sakai, one of Japan's greatest aces, later wrote in his diary that something felt different about the lightnings. Their timing had changed. Their response was sharper. He couldn't understand why. In September, 40 modified P-38s took to the skies. Loss ratios dropped from one, two to nearly one. One. In some battles, Americans even gained the advantage, all because of a six-inch piece of wire. Eventually, inspectors noticed strange modifications inside the aircraft. Crew chiefs developed a routine. Remove the tensioner before inspections, reinstall it afterward. 
It became a secret tradition, mechanics honoring the man who saved their pilots. A report reached Lockheed. They flew engineers to New Guinea to examine the change. After testing, the verdict came. Safe, effective. Should have been in the original design. By December 1943, the P-38J model featured the official tensioning system. McKenna's solution had become part of the aircraft's DNA, but his name was never mentioned. No medal, no recognition, not even a footnote. He was just a mechanic. Yet every pilot who survived because of him knew the truth. Hayes returned home after the war with 11 confirmed kills. He became a crop duster, flying peacefully over fields instead of battlefields. Every year on August 17th, he called McKenna just to say thanks. Mitchell became a colonel and told the story to every young pilot he trained. And McKenna, he opened a small garage in Long Beach where he repaired engines for the next 42 years. When anyone asked him about the war, he simply shrugged and said, I just did my job. In 1991, a historian tracked him down for an interview. McKenna sat in a quiet workshop filled with tools.